and welcome to the first Science at Work video. This week we're meeting Florence Nightingale. Thank you so much for all your pictures and questions. We really couldn't believe how many we received. The video comes in two parts. In the first part, Florence is going to tell you all about her life and work, and then she's going to answer lots of your questions. My dear ladies and gentlemen, how do you do? I should introduce myself to you, although it is said that I am the most famous nurse in history, and I've already seen that you've drawn such marvellous pictures of me. Thank you ever so much for those. I am, of course, Florence Nightingale, the Lady with the Lamp. I was born in 1820 in Florence in Italy. My mamma and papa travelled throughout Europe after they got married, and when they visited the city of Florence, they loved it so much that they named me after it. Now that was actually most unusual, because at the time, Florence was a little boy's name, not a little girl's name. Thank you very much, mamma and papa. When I was just a year old, I returned to England with my family, my mamma, papa and my sister Parthenope. Now, would you believe it, but as a child, I was in fact incredibly shy. But although I was incredibly shy, I was also incredibly clever. So much so that my papa taught me five languages and he taught me philosophy and history, not the subjects usually taught to little girls. And so I had a little boy's name and a little boy's education. But other than my studies, which I adored, I remember my childhood as being out in the fields, playing with my wonderful animals, because I have had some rather incredible pets. I have always loved animals. Do you? I've always loved looking after them. In fact, you would often find me working with a cat tied round my neck in a knot. Oh, I've had some wonderful pets in my time. But perhaps my favourite companion of all was my dear pet owl Athena. Oh lovely Athena, I found her in Athens and took her under my wing so to speak. She was a bit fierce at first but we became the best of friends, so much so that she travelled around with me everywhere I went in my pocket. <laughs> I've always loved caring for animals. As a little girl I loved caring for my dolls and as I grew older I would look after my own family. And then it came to me. I know what I want to do with my life. I love looking after things. I should become a nurse and care for the sick. Now, what do you think my parents thought about me becoming a nurse? Well, I can tell you they weren't very happy about it at all. They didn't like the idea of me, an educated woman from a wealthy background, going and working in a hospital. Hospitals at the time were seen as incredibly dirty places and nursing was not seen as a good job. But I was determined, and so I read every book that I could find on the subject. I went to visit hospitals near where I lived in Derbyshire, and I went across to Europe, and I visited hospitals there and helped out. But it was in 1847 when I was in Rome. Has anybody been to Rome? It's a wonderful city in Italy. It was in Rome that I met the fantastic and brilliant politician Sidney Herbert. Sidney Herbert was in Rome with his beautiful wife. And when we met, oh, we got on so well. And in fact, he was incredibly interested in everything that I was doing. So much so that when I came back to England, he introduced me to some very important people who by then had come to know that I was the expert on hospitals and nursing. Florence is now going to tell us all about how she got involved in the Crimean War and why she became famous for treating all of the soldiers. And then in 1854, something happened. A war broke out, the Crimean War. Turkey and Russia were at war, and England and France went out to support Turkey in the fight against Russia. So many soldiers were involved in that war, and in fact, 30,000 British soldiers went across to the Crimea. 
The boats were so full of soldiers, in fact, that there was little room for anything else. There was not enough room for the medical supplies and other things that those soldiers should need if they were to become injured in the war. A week after they arrived, the British and the French soldiers won the Battle of the Alma, but the wounded soldiers paid the price because there wasn't enough equipment to look after them and there was no proper place for them to go. And so the wounded soldiers lay on the floor in a farmyard and there they had operations like amputations on the back of old doors used as makeshift tables with nothing to numb the pain. And there was a terrible sickness called cholera which weakened the soldiers that were already suffering from their injuries. Now, as the war went on, many of the soldiers were taken to the hospital at Skatari in Turkey but I read in the Times newspapers that there was a shortage of doctors and medicine and bandages. In fact, some soldiers were lying in corridors on the floor, often left with for weeks without anybody to look after them. Then, on the 15th of October in 1854, I received a letter from my dear friend Sidney Herbert, the politician, who had now become Secretary at War. And in that letter he asked, would I go out and help at Scutari Hospital? Of course I accepted. Now was my chance to follow my ambition. So off I went with my team of nurses, 38 in total, 24 of whom were nuns, and only 14 had had experience in a hospital before. We set off on the 21st of October in 1854. Oh, the voyage was incredibly rough and I got incredibly seasick. But when we arrived, the doctors weren't pleased to see us at all. For after all, they thought, what could a young lady possibly know or do to help? They thought that we would just get in the way. But I was determined. And as the bitter winter drew in, I knew my work was about to begin in earnest. When we arrived, it was far worse than we could have possibly imagined. The hospital was completely filthy. The drains were blocked, the toilets were overflowing, there were rats running around, and the place smelt absolutely awful. Now, I have always believed in cleanliness, and so we started to clean, and it wasn't an easy task. We unblocked the drains, we removed 556 handcarts and large baskets full of rubbish, 24 dead animals and two horses were buried. We lime washed the walls and we opened the windows to let in the fresh air. And as we cleaned, I could see an improvement in the soldiers. I had to write several letters to England to my friend Sidney Herbert to ask for more supplies because we needed more bed linen, more bandages, more medicine and we desperately needed to improve the diet for the soldiers because they weren't getting enough vitamins and minerals which meant many of them were getting an awful illness called scurvy which caused some of their toes to fall off. And as we began to make improvements in the hospital we thought the worst was over but Suddenly, an illness swept through the hospital, and over a period of three weeks, four doctors and three nurses also died. Something was terribly wrong, and many soldiers and nurses and surgeons became very ill indeed, and so we did our best to find out what was causing this mystery illness. And some of the nurses noticed that many beds were fatal, that is to say that if a soldier slept in a bed near the toilet, they became very ill indeed. And we realised that it was because they were breathing in poisonous gases. I strongly believe no man should die alone and that every soldier should be cared for. And so I would walk the wards late at night when it was pitch black and I would use a lamp to light my path. And that is why they call me Lady with the Lamp. I would walk for hours, making sure that every soldier was looked after. I would talk to them, sit with them, keep them company and help them write letters home. I was very kind to them and they were very kind to me in return. On July the 16th in 1856, the last patient left the barrack hospital. But my work was not over. When I returned to England, I was determined to forever change the way patients were cared for. Every patient deserves first-rate care. And I was also determined to change the way soldiers were treated. Before the war, soldiers were seen and treated as the scum of the earth. But my work changed all that. 
and soldiers were seen as a symbol of courage, loyalty and endurance. I was also determined to change the way nurses were treated, and so nurses would no longer be seen as the lazy individuals, but as incredibly hard-working and kind. But when I returned from the Crimea, I was blighted by ill health. And although I never made a public appearance, I continued my work from home. I wrote notes on nursing, what it is and what it is not, and I also created detailed plans of how hospitals should be set out. And, of course, I created the first ever school for nursing. just a little bit about my story. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for sending me your questions. I've got some of them here right now. Now let me have a look. Here we have it. Ooh, Eddie and Tom from Newcastle have asked how many people and soldiers did you save? How many soldiers did you mend in the war? Well Eddie and Tom thousands were saved by the dedication of my team. I could not claim to have done it on my own. I was blessed to have a dedicated team of nurses. But although many were saved, many were also lost. And that is very hard to bear. Gabby from Enfield in London asks, how did you know that more soldiers were dying from disease and not from their wounds? Well, Gabby, from my experience as a nurse in London, I could recognise what the symptoms of disease were. Mayor from Newcastle asks, how did you take care of them all? Well, Mayor, with kindness, cleanliness and respect. Every patient deserves to be treated with dignity and respect. And it was of utmost importance that we made sure that the soldiers and everything around them was as clean as possible. And, of course, we made sure that they had a good diet, because a healthy diet is very important indeed. Ah, Gwilym from Cardiff asks... How did the soldiers react to your discovery about the importance of cleanliness? Well, William, before I arrived at the Barrack Hospital, it was incredibly unclean, and there were rats everywhere and soldiers lying on the floor in dirty blankets. Now, the soldiers definitely did respond well to their environment being much cleaner. They also responded well to kindness, calm tones, and somebody caring for them. And Sarah from Glasgow asks, how long did it take for the soldiers to get better? Well, it really does depend on the patient, you see. Every patient has to be treated differently, from 24 hours from disease or maybe weeks for an injury. You really can't tell, but every patient needs your patience, time and care. Taken from East Sussex asks, why did you go round with a lamp at night? Well taken, my nurses were dismissed in the evening, but my work would never stop, for there was so much to do. I would often work 24 hours a day, sometimes eight hours on my knees bandaging patients. And if I were to sleep, I would only sleep two to four hours at a time. But at night time, I would walk the wards four miles in total, and I would have to use my lamp to guide my way, because there was no electricity, and so it was completely pitch black. And I would walk with my lamp to make sure that the soldiers were attended to at night, for at night time, it was often the time that they felt the most lonely, and so I would sit with them, keep them company, and help them write letters home to their families that they were deeply missing. Romy and Matilda from Birmingham ask, do you wear gloves for protection and why did you not wear gloves like nurses do now? Well, no, we didn't. Gloves were not worn by nurses back then, but we did make sure that we washed our hands thoroughly. And Lexi from Birmingham asks, 
Why did they not change bed sheets when they were covered in people's blood and sick? Well, yes, before we arrived at the Barrack Hospital, the soldiers had little else but dirty blankets. We had to work incredibly hard because supply was short, and so I had to write many letters to England to Sidney Herbert to ask for clean bed linen. He could tell how cross I was by how many dots there were on the page and how many holes there were in the paper. I was very passionate and determined, and also we would go to the local markets to get supplies from there, and the soldiers' wives would work in the laundry to make sure that there was a constant supply. But it was no easy task. Jamie in East Sussex asks, How often did you wash your dress and apron? Well, I always try to stay as clean as possible, and under some circumstances that can be incredibly difficult. But the apron is worn over the clothes to protect your dress or whatever you're wearing, and it is of utmost importance to keep your apron clean, and so I would do that as often as I could. Bradley in the southwest of England asks, how does washing your hands help stop germs? Well, Bradley, I believe in cleanliness and hygiene at all times. It is very important to keep your hands clean because it is with your hands that you touch your patients and so you must keep them clean. Now, although we did not know about germs at the time, we did know that cleanliness was of utmost importance. Evie from Enfield asks, as you were spending so much time in a hospital, did you often get sick yourself? Well, that's a good question, Evie. The answer is that the fever that swept through the hospital made very many people ill, and it was on a visit to one of the smaller army hospitals that I actually myself caught the illness. It was just after my 35th birthday, and I became so ill that I could barely walk. In fact, some thought I might die, but fortunately I did, did recover, although I was forever weakened by the illness. Evangeline from Enfield asks, what would Florence Nightingale make of the coronavirus? Well, Evangeline, I have to say that I haven't heard of it, and I'm not sure what a virus is. I suspect this must be some modern illness that I haven't heard about, but my principle to treating any ailment is always the same. You must make sure that everything is as clean as possible, you must open the windows to let the fresh air in, and spend time outside. If you have one, go into your garden or into the park. There is wonder to be found in nature, and you must make sure that you look after your mind as well as your body, because both are important for your health. Erin from Glasgow asks, What happened to the hospitals when Florence Nightingale died? Did they go back to being dirty? Well, Erin, my book, Notes on Nursing and Other Works, set detailed examples of how hospitals should be laid out. And furthermore, my school for nursing will tell nurses how they should look after patients. It is my sincerest wish that nursing continues to be a respected profession. I have laid the template for others to follow. And Maxon in Cardiff asks, did people listen to Florence when she explained that the hospital should be clean in order for people to get better? Well, some didn't believe me at first. In fact, the doctors at Scutari Hospital thought I was making a fuss about nothing. But after I returned from the Crimean War, my opinion was respected because I had experience first hand. Now, Kieran in East Sussex asks, what do you like about nursing? Well, caring for people and seeing their recovery. Nursing really is an art. And Lily from Salford and Lena from Enfield ask, what was your inspiration to become a nurse? What made you want to become a nurse? Well, as a child, I enjoyed looking after my animals. I've always had an instinct for caring for things. I was nursing long before I knew what nursing was. Rory from Newcastle asks, when did you decide you wanted to be a nurse? Well, I've always loved nursing. I suspect my first patient was a dog that had injured his leg. I looked after that dog as a child. But I've always had an instinct for looking after things. But it was just before my 17th birthday that I had a calling from God. And that was when I was absolutely determined that nursing was what I wanted to do with my life. And Milo from Enfield asks, did anyone stop you from being a nurse? Well, 
People did try to stop me, Milo. Mama and Papa did not want me to become a nurse because they thought that a woman from my position in life, with a wealthy background and an education, should get married, stay at home and look after the family. But that was not what I wanted to do. I was determined that nursing was my calling. I wasn't to be stopped. And finally, Raffaella from the Wirral asks, what books should I read to become a nurse like you, even though I am only five? Well done, five is a lovely age. Well, Raffaella, my advice to you is to read notes on nursing with your parents. It contains some very important key words that will help you. And many nurses say that it was the first book that they ever read. I can certainly vouch for it with confidence as I wrote it myself. And it was a bestseller when it was released in 1859. And Lexi in London asks, what is your favorite food? Well, Lexi, food is incredibly important. I enjoy anything nutritious because fresh fruit and vegetables are very, very good for your health. I particularly like fruit. Well, that is the answer to your questions. Thank you so much for sending them in. I have so enjoyed my time with you today. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you for that, Florence. That really was interesting. I hope everyone else learnt as much as we did. Now, don't forget, next week's Science at Work video will show how important Florence at Work has been for medicine today. We'll be meeting two doctors, Zania and Phoebe. Zania is a scientist who does research into how our bodies fight viruses, and Phoebe is a hospital doctor who is looking after patients with coronavirus. Don't forget to download the activity sheet about Zania and Phoebe, and then don't forget to send us your questions and pictures by 3pm on Thursday the 30th of April. You haven't got long. See you then. Bye.